What's up guys, welcome back to another video. This is a reaction to how US became a superpower and I think it means it's missing how the US. But um, yeah, this is a channel called The Military Show. Never reacted to it before, but I did see another video pop up and I scrolled through the channel and I saw this one was another one that was posted recently. And I feel like this is, this is a channel that I could react to quite a few things depending on if I can find more. But from what I've seen, it seems like there's topics that I feel like I'll be interested in. And some of you will be interested in as well. But we're going to check this out. Um, links are in the description to my Patreon where you can see reactions that I can't post to YouTube. Forrest Gump reactions are coming very soon. And there's a lot of classic film reactions from the past. And based off suggestions, more to come in the future. But we're going to check this out. Also, links are in the description to this channel as well if you're interested. If you enjoy this video, links are there for this channel. And let's jump into this. Today, the United States is the largest superpower in the world. But has that always been the case? The answer to that question is a resounding no. In fact, up until the Second World War, the United States had no interest in becoming a major power. If that's true, how did America become a superpower? And why did it happen after World War II? We hear the word superpower all of the time, but what does that really mean? You'd be surprised to learn that there's no real definition of what makes a country a superpower at least one that everyone can agree on. Also, there are no specific numbers a country needs to achieve to be considered a superpower, be it the size of the army, the country's GDP, or the number of allies it has. So if there's no definition of- So say the US didn't, like in World War II, it just didn't get involved, and it just stayed on its, like it was just it's on its own sort of, I don't know, trend, or just on, on its, just stayed basically just the US was the US. Do you think it would be as powerful as it was today? Do you think it'd be richer as, it, as rich as it is today? Like, all these things? Because there's pros and cons to both sides of things, I feel like. And I'm, it's just interesting to think of if they just... I don't know if they were completely keeping to themselves, but if they mostly kept to themselves, how different would the world be now and how different would the US be as well? I mean, the world would probably be a lot different and the US would be a lot different as well, but it's just crazy to think that if there is alternate universes, there's probably one where the US just stayed on, stayed on its own lane and... It'd just be interesting to see how different everything would be. ...of superpower, or specific numbers that a country needs to achieve, then how do you know if you are a superpower? It mostly comes down to what other countries think. If they believe you are a superpower, then you probably are a superpower. But that is not enough to define superpower. We must look deeper into what makes a superpower. I didn't realise how much bigger China is than India. Although a lot of China is mountainous, that is kind of wild to see. Perhaps there are certain traits that all superpowers share. In fact, there are. Military might. Superpowers need to have a large and powerful military. They must be able to project force almost everywhere in the world, on the ground, in the air, and at sea. Their weapons are technologically superior to other countries and almost always have military bases spread across the globe. Economic strength. A superpower must have a strong economy. This can be best measured through its gross domestic product. What is GDP? It's a way to measure the total value of all goods and services produced within a country. A high GDP typically indicates a strong economy. There are other factors as well. A moderate inflation rate, low unemployment, an extensive infrastructure, a reasonable amount of foreign debt. International influence. A superpower can convince other countries to support its interests, policies, and actions. Often this takes the form of countries sharing mutual interests and building strong alliances. In extreme situations, a superpower has the willingness to impose economic sanctions and sometimes will threaten military action to get its way. Although these three factors, military might, a strong economy, and being able to influence other countries are the hallmarks of a superpower, there are other factors as well. Superpowers are politically stable. It doesn't matter if they are democratic or authoritarian, just that the government is stable. Superpowers tend to have large populations and plentiful resources. They possess advanced technology, and their people have a strong sense of nationalism. They have a unified culture, and there is little or no sectionalism. So now we know the traits of a superpower. Let's look at some of the countries that may have been considered superpowers in the modern era. Britain may have been- Let me guess some. Wait, in the modern era? So the US, China, Britain... Would Germany have been one at some point? I mean, it must have been because it was- and he took over the whole of Europe, and more than that as well, nearly. Uh, the USSR, or the Soviet Union. Modern era, modern era, I'm trying to think of some European country, like Portugal? 
But is that modern era? I don't really think it is. ...being considered a superpower at one time. At the dawn of the 20th century, Britain possessed almost all of the traits of a superpower. It had a large military and the most powerful navy in the world. And with that navy, it could project power almost anywhere. It had a vast network of colonies, so vast that it was once said that the sun never set on the British Empire. It was highly influential in world affairs and had a strong economy based on manufacturing and trade. Although Britain itself did not possess vast resources, it was able to rely on its colonies to produce everything it needed. Its internal population was not particularly large, but when combined with its colonies, it had a significant population as well. It had all the earmarks of a superpower. But what about the United States? What's the background story here? The answer may surprise you. Throughout most of its history, the United States was considered a minor, relatively insignificant country. Where is this, by the way? This looks wild. Is this, is this the Florida Keys? I don't think it is, but this place looks crazy. It was far from Europe, had a very small army, and had little interest in becoming a major power. Aside from the Western Hemisphere, the United States largely ignored the rest of the world. That began to change in 1898 as a result of the Spanish-American War. Almost everyone expected Spain would win, and win easily. After all, it was militarily much larger, yet the Americans swiftly defeated the Spanish at sea and on land. Not only did the United States soundly defeat a major European power, it had done so in a mere six weeks. What was even more impressive was that the United States had been able to capture Spanish territory far from its shores. By the end of the war, America controlled several territories in the Caribbean. It had also wrestled control of the Philippines Islands far from America's shores. With the Philippines, America now had a foothold in Asia, a base from which it could trade throughout the region. It also annexed the Hawaiian Islands, allowing it to control part of the Central Pacific Ocean. To everyone's surprise, the United States had built a small empire for itself. Europe began to realize that the United States had the potential to become a world power. Its vast resources and manufacturing capabilities had long been known, but in its war with Spain, the United States had shown an unexpected military capability. Not only could it raise an army very quickly, from less than 30,000 soldiers to 220,000 in a matter of months, it could fight far beyond its territorial waters. It was the perfect opportunity for the United States to establish itself as a rising power. Yet, within a few years, the United States lost interest in the rest of the world and retreated into isolationism. Damn. It slashed the size of its military and refused to involve itself in European politics. It remained that way until 1917, when it entered the First World War. Much like the Spanish-American War, the United States entered the First World War with a small military. In fact, the army was smaller than 13 of the states that were already active in the war. It had a standing army of less than 130,000 soldiers in 1917. A year later, it had 4 million men under arms, Jesus half Christ. of them serving in Europe. And again, the United States showed that it could project force far from home. At its peak, some 10,000 soldiers arrived in France each day. For a time, however, it appeared that America wanted to become part of a wider world. It even proposed the creation of an international body to resolve disputes through dialogue, diplomacy, and mediation. It was the first institution of its kind in the modern era. Instead of returning to isolation, the United States sought to bring the nations of the world together and participate in the global community beyond trade and military actions. It was called the League of Nations. More than 40 nations signed on to the League of Nations immediately. These included major powers such as the United Kingdom and France, lesser powers such as Japan and the newly formed Soviet Union Oh, so at this point in time, there was sort of an agreement in this sense then, okay. were also founding members. They were joined by many other countries around the world, including Brazil, China, South Africa, and others. At its peak, the League of Nations had more than 60 members, with representatives from every region of the world. Yet, the country that proposed the idea of the League of Nations, the United States, did not join. Oh. There was simply not enough political support to become a member of the international community. American politicians sought to retreat from world affairs and return to a policy of isolationism, and so they did. When the Second World War broke out in 1939, the United States sought to avoid becoming a direct participant in the conflict. It was willing to go to great lengths to ensure that the Allies were provided with weapons and resources, but nothing more. That changed on December 7, 1941 when Japan launched a massive surprise attack. So if the US weren't involved, why would Japan just 
bomb them? I mean, I've done videos on this before, and I, maybe I've just forgot, but why would they just go out of the way to bomb? Is it because the US were supporting Europe to a degree with supplying them with things? Like, if they didn't do this, they probably would have won the war. I mean, it would have been a lot more likely. So it's just kind of wild to me that Japan were like, yeah, we're going to just bomb you out of nowhere. On America's largest military base in the Pacific, Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. Japan had been a country on the rise for several decades and had great ambitions to become a powerful nation that wielded great power and influence. Japan believed that the time had come to drive Western influence out of East Asia and liberate its Asian brothers from European and American exploitation. And once liberated, it was Japan's responsibility to protect them. It sounded like a noble cause, but it sought to free Asia through exploitation. They understood that to build an empire, Japan needed to build a strong economy and a powerful military, but lacked the natural resources needed to expel the West. It believed that the only way that it could achieve its goals was to seize those resources by force. It soon found itself at odds with the United States, which objected to Japanese expansionism. Japan was not overly concerned with the United States. It saw them as a weak enemy whose people lacked the political will to fight Jeez. a war. It believed that a single strike on the American Navy would end the war with a single blow. Not everyone agreed that the United oh, shit, States was a weak country or that its people would avoid war at all costs. One of Japan's greatest military leaders, Admiral Isoroku Yamamoto, knew the potential of the United States. He had spent a considerable amount of time in America. He understood the vastness of America's resources, its industrial capabilities, and a strong sense of determination among its people. Yamamoto saw the United States as a sleeping giant that, once awakened, would prove to be a dangerous enemy. And he was right. The United States did not. So he saw that and thought, yeah, let's just bomb them instead. Let's just awaken it. Maybe it's 20, 30 years before it would have been awakened, but they were just like, yeah, we're just going to do it now. <laughs> it's just silly, man. Not back down after the destruction of its fleet at Pearl Harbor. Japan had woken the giant, and that spelt doom for Japan and its German ally. The United States had long been an industrial powerhouse. Although many American factories closed through the Great Depression, they were quickly reopened and retooled to produce war materials. New factories were built, increasing the amount of goods the United States could produce. With its vast natural resources, the United States had the necessary materials to supply its factories. It mobilized its population, which had grown to 150 million people, to work in its factories and serve in the military. In 1941, the US military had 1.4 million men under arms. By 1945, the size of the American military had grown to 12 million. The army itself had increased from 1.4 million soldiers to well over 8 million in just four years. It also developed a secret weapon, one that would change the course of world history, Boom. the atomic bomb. Yes, the sleeping giant was fully awake and would never sleep again. The United States emerged from the Second World War as the most powerful nation in the world, a title that it still holds today. As a result of the Second World War, the United States went from being a B-list actor on the world stage to the biggest superstar ever known. How exactly did this happen, and why was the Second World War the catalyst for superstardom? That's what I was going to ask. How, like, it's just fascinating how around that time it was when it happened. Let's explore. The war had devastated Europe. Hardly a major city survived unscathed. Cities such as London and Berlin were barely left standing as a result of almost continuous bombing raids. During the war, the it's just crazy to think that this is what 75, 8 years ago, and cities in in England, in the UK, were getting bombed. Like, I can't even fathom that. Like, I don't know. <laughs> That's just wild. Thank God it's not happening now, but it makes you realize this isn't long ago, man. These are people that probably from the well, yeah, from my bloodline, from my ancestors and stuff that would have been getting bombed wild to think and that it just seems like such a different place now and it's not even that long ago crazy man german bombers destroyed an estimated 70,000 buildings in london another 1.7 wait how many german bombers destroyed an estimated 70,000 buildings in london oh, another 1.7 million buildings were damaged in berlin an estimated 80 percent of the city center was destroyed between allied bombing and the soviet union's assault Imagine how different these cities would look now, because these are historical cities even now, after all of this stuff that's happened. Just imagine these world... I mean, it's, obviously it's not... You can't really do it, but just imagine these world wars didn't happen, how different these cities would look. Even more history would be there. Like It's just so wild to even think about. An eventual capture of the city, 
Dresden saw 90% of its city center destroyed in a single night. Oh my but that days. was not the worst. The German city of Jülich was completely leveled. 100% of its buildings were destroyed between bombing raids and fighting for control of the city during the war. Japan too faced widespread devastation. For much of the war, the Japanese home islands were safely out of reach of American bombers. That changed in June 1944, when the United States introduced the B-29 Super Fortress, a new bomber that could reach Japan from great distances. The United States repeatedly attacked Japanese cities with firebombs, setting whole cities afire. On the night of March 9, 1945, the United States sent hundreds of bombers to attack the Japanese capital of Tokyo with incendiary bombs. Approximately 270,000 buildings, 25% of the city, were destroyed in this single attack. The fires killed an estimated 100,000 Japanese, with another million left homeless. The war ended when the United States attacked the Japanese cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki with a new secret weapon, the atomic bomb. The attack on Hiroshima either damaged or destroyed nearly 70% of the city's infrastructure. In Nagasaki, nearly 40% of the buildings were destroyed or damaged. When the war finally ended, the United States found that it was stronger than it was when it entered the war. And there are reasons for that. America was protected by thousands of miles of ocean on each side and simply could not be attacked in any meaningful way. Its cities, factories, and infrastructure remained untouched. Not only that, but America's industrial production doubled during the war. Its GDP grew by $47 billion, Dang. and the unemployment rate dropped to 1.2%. It's just perfect timing, to be fair. All the chaos going on in the world, they were like, yeah, we'll take advantage of this, and they did. America still emerged from the war as a wealthy country with tremendous industrial capabilities. It was also more technically advanced than any other country and had the strongest military in the world. It was the only country to possess the most devastating weapon known to mankind, the atomic bomb. By the end of the Second World War, the United States had all the hallmarks of a superpower, except for one, a willingness to participate in global affairs. In the past, American politicians had no interest, no ambitions to become a leading nation. It had shown this mentality after the First World War when it chose to turn its back on the League of Nations and withdrew from European affairs, but this time would be different. The United States would embrace the rest of the world. It did so in many different ways. The United States committed itself to rebuilding Europe, specifically Western Europe. Through the Marshall Plan, the United States provided Western Europe with significant financial support. I didn't even know this. I mean, I, I knew they supported them, but I didn't know this. This is what I'm learning about. Fair enough, man. And made available the necessary materials. So I was sort of thinking, how would these, like, when it was sort of mentioned, obviously, you, you, you learn about this in school, about the, the devastation in the cities. But how would these countries that were absolutely financially done for rebuild these cities? And, well, here we go. I'm finding out right now. Reels for countries to rebuild their cities, infrastructure, and manufacturing capabilities. It also helped rebuild Japan and created new political institutions that favored the United States. It later began to provide foreign aid to other countries around the world to curry favor among less developed countries. The United States also helped to establish and actively participate in new international institutions such as the United Nations, the International Monetary Fund, and the World Bank, all of whom had headquarters in the United States. It filled political and economic voids in many parts of the world as a result of the demise of the British, French, and Japanese empires. It formed military alliances such as NATO and positioned itself to become the protector of the free world. The United States was not the only country that became a superpower from the ashes of the Second World War. It was joined by the Soviet Union, which would eventually become America's biggest enemy. The Soviet Union had suffered greatly during the Second World War, especially in the early years of the conflict, but gained strength as the war progressed by 1945, it was determined to control all of the territory it had captured from Germany. It had twice been devastated by Germany and was forced to exit the First World War before the conflict ended. After the Second World War, Russia was determined to create a buffer zone between itself and potential future adversaries. The countries of Eastern Europe would serve as that buffer zone. To ensure their loyalty, the Soviets installed communist puppet states. Europe became divided into two camps countries that favored the United States and countries that favored the Soviet Union. This ultimately led to a Cold War in which most of the world would become polarized between the two. And what we notice now is the countries that favored, I don't know, did, did the, I don't really know much about the history here, did these countries favor the USSR 
or the Soviet Union, or were they just sort of forced into it? I don't know. Maybe their political views were aligned as well as that, but I feel like more so maybe it was just they were sort of taken by force. I don't know. I actually don't know. But if you're putting up puppet, like, um, puppet, um, political parties or whatever it is, just basically just be people that are controlled by the USSR, you're putting them in charge of these countries. It doesn't sound very good, but then at the same time, it works both ways around, to be fair. But you see how it is now. A lot of this side benefited a lot more than some of these countries. And now some of these countries are doing a lot better because they've, they're have they not now basically force-controlled. Um, and they're starting to prosper more. But you can see sort of which one benefited more. And it was definitely more the west side of Europe, to be honest. Two countries. This is not just the west, central Europe. There's a lot of countries... Um, even just yeah just around basically that changed in the early 1990s when the soviet union collapsed the reborn russian federation was still a superpower but much weaker than it had been it soon regained its strength and russia began to challenge the united states as a new cold war started to emerge russia proved to be a paper tiger however when it invaded ukraine in february 2022 the global community believed the conflict would last only a few weeks Nobody ever expected Ukraine to fight back in any meaningful war, but it did. After Ukraine beat back the initial Russian advance, the Western powers began to slowly arm Ukraine with modern weaponry. I don't really know what's happening in Ukraine now. They're still fighting, but like, is it like still like a war zone? Like, how is it going on now? Western arms changed the tide of the war. Russian equipment proved to be significantly inferior to American, British, and French weaponry. And today, the Russian army is on the defensive. Russia's status as a superpower has been questioned as a result of its failure on the battlefield and the fact that world opinion has turned against it. Russia has very little influence in world affairs and it's a I can't lie, one thing about Russia though, the buildings there are absolutely beautiful. Economy is in tatters. It no longer meets the key qualifications of a superpower. If Russia Jeez. is no longer a superpower, could the United States eventually lose its superpower status too? That's what I'm thinking, that's so wild to think because you've got China now who really do seem like they are like just yeah forget russia it's china now pretty much that kind of thing i wonder how that's gonna be and then when you got russia and china together it kind of, seems kind of scary it's possible but not anytime soon america still possesses all of the traits of a superpower but some areas are starting to weaken the united states has amassed a staggering amount of debt in recent decades and it faces a serious trade deficit that increases every year just last year alone the trade deficit increased by more than 10%, and there are no signs that the situation will improve in the next few years. Political divisions are widening, and the ability to compromise is becoming more difficult. Even election results have been called into question. But not all is lost. America remains the most powerful nation in the world. It has a modern and powerful military that is second to none. Its economy remains the largest in the world, and there is no evidence that its influence on world affairs is in decline. Problems can be fixed, and the United States will remain a superpower for the foreseeable future. But will it be the only superpower? China may be on the verge of becoming a superpower. It possesses many of the qualities of a superpower. It has the second largest economy in the world. It has the largest army in the world, and it's rapidly modernizing its military. China has the third largest nuclear stockpile, and is actively expanding its arsenal. God China has damn. a strong and unified government, and its influence outside of Asia is growing. It has the largest population in the world and possesses advanced technology. Yet China is facing some headwinds in its attempt to become a superpower. Its economy may not be as strong as it appears, and its navy still needs to build more ships that can operate far from its shores. And also, isn't there a real problem with like the population and like the, the age of the like, what's the population? The population tree or whatever it's called. When there's a lot, there's a lot less younger people being born and a lot old, a lot more people in the middle and that are older. And it's going to be in like the younger people, the younger generation, they're going to be struggling to say the least. Yes, China has the potential to become a superpower, but that might not be as soon as people think. What do you think? Will China become a superpower? I mean, I thought they already were a superpower. I mean, they're definitely a power, but I guess maybe to be a superpower, you have to. I don't really know, but I thought they already were, to be honest. Can it challenge the United States on the world stage? Let us know what you think in the comments below. I mean, who knows, right? It's one of those things that we'll have to see as time goes on. 
China is no longer the world's most populous country. India passed China this year. God damn, I didn't even know. Actually, I probably did know that. I just forgot. The CCP is just as much of a paper tiger as you... Maybe it is then. I don't really know, to be honest. As many in, as many have said in previous video, previous videos, China's Navy, tu Navy lacks a total tonnage compared to the US Navy, meaning it has fewer large ships meant to operate thousands of miles in the middle of nowhere. But isn't... I mean, obviously, navies are still very important, right? But isn't it one of those things like where... The Navy probably isn't as much... I mean, again, you want a strong Navy. If you're going to be a superpower, you want to be strong on all fronts. But aren't they, like, focusing on different stuff? Like, I swear they've got a crazy missile technology. I don't even know exactly what it is, but I swear they can, like, go out of the atmosphere and back in. I don't know fully, but I swear they've been got... Like, they've got some crazy technologies. I don't know. China... <laughs> China might have a large military that's modernizing, but it's untested in real modern combat, whereas the USA military is tested and has real combat experience under its belt. That's true, and I do think that's quite important, to be fair. I think the last time China fought in a war was the 70s, but, but isn't it sort of gearing up to that now, where China are going to sort of be like, yep, yeah, um, Taiwan will get you, and then they'll just slowly probably get more confidence from that. I don't know, but um, I mean, hopefully there's never a war between the two. That's honestly just the worst case scenario. But yeah, let me know your thoughts on this. It's a fascinating video to learn about the history of, and also about the idea of yeah, the US sort of had a completely different mindset and then it just completely switched and then it sort of led to where we are like where we are currently to this day. But yeah, let me know your thoughts and then until next time, peace.